Al. Good morning, church. It is so good to see you. I tell you what, I got a story that is just going to shock you. If you haven't heard this before, I was just a wee little scutter, 18 years old. I had gone off on my own to seek biblical knowledge. I was at Sanford University, and I was minding my own business. I had my food tray. I had snuck away from the cafeteria, and I was at the famous Birmingham Southern cooking restaurant called the Paw Paw Patch. Oh, we should have a moment of silence just as we remember. It is the most incredible Southern food. It's the kind that you go through, and you grab like a mountain of mashed potatoes and a mountain of macaroni and cheese and a mountain of key lime pie. And it comes in mountains, and a mountain of banana pudding. And bread, and I mean, it's just incredible stuff. And I went through that thing because I thought it was a buffet. <laughs> Ends up, it's a la carte. And my bill was $97. <laughs> so I quickly started putting some things, we don't need that, we don't need that, put that back. And so I got, me and my, one of my seminary friends, David, we went and we got a booth, kind of what we thought was all by itself, off on the side so we could talk. We're both 18, new at Sanford. We're freshmen. We don't know nothing. We are just young skulls full of mush, just waiting for divine knowledge before the end. And we sit down, and he looks at me, and he goes, you or me, you or me. And we know right away, because we're ministerial students. We're spiritual. One of us had the privilege of returning thanks. I said, I'll do it, because I'm looking at this. I mean, I got drool coming down my chin. I am so, I can't wait to dive into this. So I, I prayed a very earnest prayer, maybe a little longer than usual. Lord, I thank you for this food. Oh, my goodness. Mmm, it looks so good. It smells so good. And I am one broke, starving college student. And God, I pray this food will last me a week. I pray, Lord, that you would somehow make these calories somehow be healthy and get me through the way. And I went on and on. And I said, Amen. But unbeknownst to me and to my ministerial student friend, a guy, a large guy, had silently snuck up to our table and was towering over us with an angry scowl on his face. So I said, amen, and I'm like, whoa, hi, and he looked, I kid you not, he leaned in, he said, do you really believe that mess? I, mean, I was stunned. Thankfully, I just, I said, uh, yes, sir, <laughs> I do, and he leaned forward, face still full of anger, he said, why? What would you say? Because... I don't have those preloaded answers at age 18. I'm not steeped in script. I didn't, you know, it's not a quarter century later where I kind of have an idea of what I would say. In that moment, God gave me one of those rare, beautiful shafts of light. He gave me the perfect response. And I know it was his because it was perfect. It was awesome. It wasn't like, and I look at him and he said, why? Why do I believe this? And in an instant, I looked right up and I said, sir, I believe because he has absolutely changed my life. Wow, what a great answer, right? I know it wasn't for me. His face got angrier, and he leaned in, and he said, really? Well, that's awesome. I'm a Christian, too. I just wanted to say hi. God bless you guys. Have a good dinner. And he walked off. <laughs> I look at David, and I said, did that just happen? That is incredible. I mean... He didn't, obviously he didn't mean his question. He was just had his strange way of encouraging us, I guess. But I mean, it was, I probably lost a pound of sweat during that just two minute conversation. And while that guy may not have meant his question, millions do. Millions of people look at us who go to church, who believe in the Lord as strange, as odd, as peculiar. In fact, it's a growing number of people as those who really hold fast to the faith become an increasingly more and more marginalized, a little bit, you're so weird, I can't believe you believe the, the things in that book. Because if you haven't heard that question, maybe you've heard the other ones. Do you really believe the fairy tales in that book? Or maybe you've heard the one that says, you know what, the church, I'm okay with it, but I think it's a man-made invention. Or how about this one, I don't really need to go to church because my relationship with God is personal, and I can worship God in the trees with the butterflies and on the lake. And yeah, you can. I always want to ask, but, but do you, right? <laughs> Just want to call them up, 1035, go, how's the fish? Yeah, are you singing to Jesus right now? Yeah, you having a good time worshiping God? I bet you're not. But if you haven't heard that one, maybe you have heard this one, the Mac Daddy of all of them, that I am hearing more and more, and it's this one right here. I have had it 
with organized religion. Anybody heard this one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I've got good news. We're not that organized. <laughs> right? And beyond that, if I'm being honest, I kind of had it with religion too. In fact, just between us, religious people, they kind of get on my nerves. You know what I'm talking about? Those people that are so super spiritual, you can't even have a conversation with them. They almost speak in King James all the day long. And you're like, man, you're so weird. <laughs> what is, and this is coming from a pastor. See, I don't need a religion. You know what I need? I need a relationship with a God who writes himself into my story and comes and meets with me and knows my mess to lead me through my brokenness, through my struggles, through the pain and all the junk and the day-to-day -day ups and downs that I'm going through. I, see, religion is that man-made attempt to reach up to a God that's distant, that's kind of somewhere out there, maybe like a giant Santa Claus, but a relationship with Christ, oh my goodness, well, that changes everything. Someone who wrote himself into the story, into history, and made it his story, oh, sign me up for that. I need someone who will walk with me, who's been here, who gets it, who becomes my high priest, who says, man, I feel what you're going through. I've been tempted like you, but in all ways, he never sinned once. See, that's the difference. And if you find yourself in the same boat as me, awesome, welcome. You are in good company, and you came to the right place. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 3 today that is so incredible, so mind-blowing, we're going to see that God is actually going to reveal today a secret, a secret that is so profound, so amazing, it has been hidden up until this moment, okay? Don't miss this. This is a secret so massive, so shrouded in mystery, that up until this moment, it has literally been hidden in the heart of the Father, and no one knew this. It was something, as we're going to read in a minute, that was actually planned from all along. God knew this was coming, but it is an incredible mystery that has been waiting for this moment. And Paul is the one who gets this secret revealed, and he freaks out. And he's like, this is too, too much. God, this can't be what I think you're saying, because it changes everything. It is so big, so earth-shattering, it even comes with its own name. Okay, The name of this secret, wait for it, is called the Dispensation of Grace. Yeah, that was my reaction, too, when I, <laughs> when I heard it, too. The dislocation of what? What does that mean? It's a fancy term for meaning all y'all are welcome. Grace is no longer limited to just an elite few, to just the chosen Jews. But it is now going to be opened to the Gentiles. If you're not sure what that means, that's just a fancy word for all y'all, <laughs> for all us. If you're not Jewish up until this point, it's kind of reserved for that. That was God's chosen people. But to spur on jealousy of the Jews, God says, you know what? It is open for everybody. I am going to make a way to bring all who will receive my son into the kingdom. Y'all, this was huge. Don't miss this. In the Old Testament, the church was unknown. They didn't know about that. In fact, here's something kind of going to sound almost heretical. The church was really not even talked about in the Gospels. It was, it was alluded to, but it wasn't even unveiled until Acts chapter 2. And even then, it took more epistles from Paul to fully explain it. So this idea of church, what are you talking about? Are you talking about we can have Jews and Gentiles worshiping together? Let's read this secret together. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 3. Pull up your favorite translation. I'm going to read from the message today. And while you pull that up, let me welcome those who are joining us on our online campus. If you're streaming with us today, it is awesome to have you joining us as well. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 6, it says this, The mystery is that people who have never heard of God and those who have heard of him all their lives, what I've been calling outsiders and insiders, now stand on the same ground before God. They get the same offer, the same help, the same promises in Christ Jesus. The message is now accessible and welcoming to a few to everyone across the board. Here's what Paul says next. This is my life work, helping people understand and respond to this message. It came as a sheer gift to me, a real surprise, Clark, right here, a real surprise. God's handling all the details. When it came to presenting the message to people who had no background in God's way, I was the least qualified of any of the available Christians. 
But God saw to it that I was equipped. You can be sure it had nothing to do with my natural abilities. I love this humility. This is incredible. Verse 8. And so here I am, preaching and writing about things that are way over my head. The inexhaustible riches, the generosity of Christ. It's open to everybody. Are you, is it coming through? My task is now to bring out in the open, to make plain what God, who created it all in the first place, had been doing in secret behind the scenes all along. How's he do it? Through followers of Jesus like yourselves gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known, and don't miss this, and talked about even among the angels. You know what that means? That means this has been so hidden, a secret, so shrouded in mystery, the angels were not aware of this. They literally looked down on tiptoe, holding their breath, saying, what is the Father, our Creator, doing? Look, Gabriel, Michael, gather around. Look at this. The secret is it's, he's making heaven available to everyone who will receive. What is this? This is, y'all, we don't grasp what Paul is saying here. He is talking about a unity, a oneness that had never existed before. He is literally saying, Jews and Gentiles will no longer be a Jewish church and a Gentile. You guys will be one church. And y'all, that, is, that would be a miracle. These two people hated each other. These people groups did not get along. We don't grasp the separation here. All right, let me try to paint it in modern day terms. It would be like the Pope saying, there will no longer be Protestants and Catholics. In fact, in Ireland, I disavow both. You are now one church. Good luck with that. That would be like saying, in America, there are no longer Republicans and Democrats. You are just one party. Good luck with that. Or let's bring it down home. In North Carolina, there will no longer be Duke and Carolina teams. But from here on out, you will be the same team, and you will love it. In fact, I urge you and you to hug it out. <laughs> you will now be on the same team, and you will like it. You will serve side by side, and you will like it. You will hug each other. You will even give each other a kiss on the cheek and an attaboy and say, how can I help you today? Do you see how wild that is? That's never good. Good luck with that. There's no way that would happen. This is how crazy it was. We don't grasp the, the animosity and the friction between the Jews and the Gentiles. So when Paul says, hey, guess what? We're all together now. They're, nobody, it was like, eh. No, nope, not going to happen. Do we realize? Put it this way. Jewish women were taught not to even help a Gentile woman who was delivering a child. To do so would have meant helping a lesser person bring a degraded human into the world. That is friction. Or, check this out, to have a Jew need to get to another location, they would avoid Samaria so much because it was a non-Jewish country. They would rather not walk a mile out of the way, not 10 miles, but 150 miles miles out of their way just so they don't have to dip their toe into a territory that they deemed inhabited by dogs. Their word. That's crazy. I'm cutting through, man. I don't know about you. I'm not walking 150 feet extra. 150 miles? Look at the friction. This is good. So when Paul shows up and says, this dispensation of grace, this new church is for everyone. Y'all, people were exploding. This was so unheard of. In fact, not only is there not a Jewish separate church and a separate Gentile church, God now had one church and everyone now had equal status. It was radical. It was revolutionary, but guess what? It was beautiful because it was the foundation of what we enjoy today. This is the launching of the modern church, the gospel giving equal status. In fact, let me give you a hidden gem. Verse 10, a beautiful verse. Look at it with me. It says, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his manifold wisdom. Manifold wisdom. And it's rich variety. You know what the word manifold actually means? It's not the car engine part. I mean, it is that, but it's not in this case. It's actually a reference to all the beautiful colors in a quilt. Donna Teresi made this for Little Mercy Hope, and, and, and Miss Brenda gave us this one. Look at these. This, notice how these quilts have different patchworks, different colors. 
by themselves, they're nothing fantastic. This one square by itself is not going to do its job. I can't say, oh, I'm so cold. I'm at the potter's hand. Of course I'm cold. And I take this one little square and I put it on here. And oh, that's so nice. This one little square. Oh, yes, it did. I'm so warmed up. Do, 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 do. No, it does nothing by itself. It takes all of them knit together, making a beautiful, multicolored, varied patchwork. Do you get the image? This is beautiful. And this is unheard of. Paul is blowing people's minds. He's like, that's not it. I'm not even done. I'm, this, there are so many different colors in this quilt. What we are supposed to say by this verse is the church is supposed to be God's display to the world what unity and love look like. Wow. God with flesh on. Woo. Well, pastor, that's a high bar. I think I'm just going to eat me a little donut here and not really think about that because that... That's awfully intimidating. Yeah, this is amazing. All of us together, united, showing a lost in a despairing world what love and unity looks like. They're not supposed to be a rich church anymore, or a poor church, or a white collar church, or a blue collar church, or a white church for that matter, or a black church, or a Hispanic church. They're just supposed to be the church. And anything else is confusing to a lost world who's looking to us to show hope and unity. Every time we miss the mark, they look at us and scratch their heads and say, what? <laughs> like your dog does? What's that? We're supposed to show this unity and this love. This is, it is so amazing to me. It's almost like people are, I don't know what they think heaven's going to be like. Do they honestly think when they get up there, it's going to be like, there's going to be like a, a, a Gentile corner <laughs> and a Jewish corner and a white corner, and a black corner, and a Carolina corner, and a Duke corner. Well, Duke people probably won't make it, but, you know, there's some other people. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I meant to say Auburn, because Auburn won't make it. But there will be an Alabama corner in some of these. That's a lot of corners. I know that's one weird-looking room, but you get the idea. That is not how it's going to be. If we can't get it together, man, you're going to be miserable in heaven, because there are going to be a lot of people who don't look just like us. It is going to be a beautiful patchwork, a quilt, everyone who has bended the knee and said, you are Lord Jesus. Come into my heart, sweep my sin away with the blood that you shed on the cross. You were perfect and blameless, and only you can. That's why we don't sacrifice goats anymore and stuff, because it, it didn't work. Jesus came and did away with that, the blameless, the perfect sacrifice. And so they're supposed to see this unity, and the lost world looks on, and I got to tell you guys, honestly, there's a lot of the church across the planet that does not exemplify love and unity. In fact, sometimes they see just the opposite. So is it any wonder why fewer and fewer people want to belong to the modern church? Is it any wonder when they look in and they see, man, I can get stress and disunity out here in the workplace. I don't need to go on a Sunday and see that. I got my cup full. Thank you, Pastor. Is it any wonder... Kerry Newhoff's a genius guy. He's a pastor. And he's written several books. And he found out, he's been mapping trends, and there is a trend that is alarming. It's all over the world, but it's accelerated in America. Here's just the last few years of it. Look at that. Oh, I forgot to add, this is among active churchgoers. This doesn't even include those who say, I don't come seldom or never. This is among the faithful. Wow. That is crazy. Maybe you've seen this trend in your own family. Maybe you got family members who live elsewhere, or friends who were once so engaged, so plugged into the kingdom work, man, you couldn't keep them away. But now they are the exception to join and plug in rather than the norm. Or maybe you've seen families that do show up, and if they do, this comic reveals exactly how they feel. Uh, Pastor, we are teaching our children here the importance of regular church attendance. Uh, what time should we pick them up? <laughs> I love it. I just drop them off. They're yours now. We're going to go to Starbucks. Well, the kids see right through that. But that's the new mentality. And we see this. So let me ask some brutally honest questions because you're safe here. That's what I love about this church. Why bother? Why even come? I mean, why attention? Why is this the place to belong? I'm going to make a shocking statement, okay? Make sure you are videoing this and you're streaming this. I'm, I am actually going on record saying this. Increasingly, I am more and more convinced that there is no point to merely attending church. Some of you know where this is going. Others of you, you just gave me that dog like, what? 
Did he just say, did he say, back that up? What did he say? I'm, I'm convinced there is no reason to merely attend church. You can, you can, I mean, let's be honest. You wake up early. You get your kids ready. Or you try. <laughs> Good night. Would you pull your pants up? I need a belt. Well, go get your belt. I don't have a belt. Yet you have a belt. I've never had a belt. Really? Why does the dog have your belt in his mouth in the backyard? Go get your pants on. You get in the car, and you have this fight on the way here. And the last thing you want to do is get out. And you're like, duh, 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 duh. you get out, and someone comes to meet you. I'm good. How are you? God bless you. Happy Sunday. And you come in, and you sit down, and hopefully you connect with maybe three or four songs, hear a message, and then you go home. And if that is the extent of what we're doing, why bother? Because you can do that in a whole lot more convenient way. Think about this. If that's all we're doing, you could do that by yourself. You could do that from the convenience of your home. You could sleep late. You could stay in your little footed pajamas. Wake up with your crazy bed hair, right? And your funky morning breath that can knock people out 10 feet away. You grab your little cup of whatever and you sip it and you open your laptop and you go crank up some Spotify or some Pandora, get some great Christian music. Or if you're really spiritual, you find a website for a church and stream and listen. Boom, you got it all. You're covered, right? Or are you? Uh, here's where this is going. You knew there was something. You knew there was a right hook coming. For hundreds of years, since, since this moment in Ephesians 3, for generations ever since that moment until recently, like our lifetime, the church was the cultural hub for the world. It was the, the, the missional hub. It was the social hub. It was the discipleship hub for the city for the world, and people would come together. But now we live in a culture that is drowning in options 24-7. You get anything you want. Anything Christian you want, boom, a click away. Anything non-Christian, boom, a click away. There's all kinds of stuff. You are drowning in options. So I ask again, why bother? Well, to answer that, I can only think of two honest reasons, two compelling reasons why you would go to church anymore. You ready for this? The first one's this. You don't attend church. You are the church. Oh, pastor, that was mean. That was mean. I saw that. You don't attend church. You are the church. We have bought into the lie that the church is a place. We don't attend church. We are the church. The reason you come is because you're part of it. You form what's called the body of Christ. The reason I gather with you is because I am part of the church. And if I shirk my responsibility, I throw more load on you. We're here to walk this road together. If you're a Christian, if you're a disciple, if you're a follower of Christ, church is not something you go to. Church is something you are. So when we gather together, we form what's literally called the body of Christ, meaning Jesus is the head. And it's a beautiful thing. You can't disassociate church from Christianity any more than you can disassociate humanity from being a person. It, it just it doesn't happen. Merely attending church doesn't make an impact on this kingdom. You know why? Because just sitting in a building, consuming church, doesn't make us very good at being the church. Wow. I should let that just sit there and, and ruminate in this room. I think being the church has something to do with living your life for Christ, demonstrating that God is real and he is loved by serving him and serving others, by going out of our way and sharing our faith, by supporting the kingdom mission. That is really different than sitting in your easy chair consuming church with a cup of joe. That is unlike anything. So here's your next takeaway right here. We will never change the world by attending church. We will only change the world by being the church. And y'all, that is radically different. If you want to boil it down, okay, and you want to get to its simplest form, and we're being open-minded here. Most of us are home folk. For the guests, I hope you can handle this. This is a place you can handle the truth. We're all safe here. You can take your masks off. There's no walls allowed. I'm just going to say something because this is basically a truth grenade. So I'm going to pull the pin. I'm going to lob it out there. Here it is. The reason you would go to church today is you have moved from being a consumer to being a contributor. So I got to ask, which one of those C words are you? Where would you say you fall between those two? In other words... You don't go just to be served, you go to serve. And there is something incredibly deep and spiritual about that. 
because you are the church. And the church is at its best when we engage in the mission God has given us to serve and to go make disciples. So if you're a Christian, church is not something you go to. It's something you are. That's why we come. That's why we get together. Church is not a building. It bothers me. To this day, I'll be with my family. We'll be driving by and someone will go, oh, look at that church, Dad. Woo, look at that. No, that is not a church. That's a building. It might be where a church gathers, but don't mistake that brick and mortar and the steeple and the stained glass for the body of Christ. Because when Christ comes back, he's not going to take with them bricks and mortar and steeples. He's taking you, those who the Holy Spirit resides inside, that have sealed and said, Father, that one's with me, that one's with me, that one's with me, let's go. It's so different. It is so radical, which brings us to the second reason, perhaps the better reason that we belong to something like this, is that church was God's idea, not man's. We didn't make this up. We hear it all the time. That's what the enemy would love for us to, to believe, that it was a human invention. Here's, a, here's the only problem with that. Even a half-hearted reading of the New Testament in the dark with one eye closed will lead you to the inescapable truth that church was God's idea. In fact, I'm going to throw another truth, truth grenade right now. Boom. You ready for it? Most of the New Testament is not about the teachings of Jesus. That got your attention. It's about the work of the church that Jesus instituted, that Jesus ordained, that Jesus loves. Check it out for yourself. Okay, you get past the Gospels, you start seeing the epistles, all the letters from the disciples, Acts, Revelation. You would have to get rid of the majority of the New Testament to argue that the church was a man-made afterthought. Something that people are like, okay, and one more thing. Oh, there's one uh, church. I was going to do church. Uh, church. We'll put that in parentheses. That's how important you are. That's how important coming together. It is about the work that Jesus initiated. If you want to get rid of the church, you have to get rid of Jesus. It's that important because he invented it. He is the one that created it. You can't have one without the other. Think about that. But the world would love for us to believe that you are better off by yourself on an island where you're having minimal impact. I wonder who would like that to become the prevalent thought of the American church. I think I have an idea. Jesus loves his church. He gave his life for the church. It is that important. He is coming back for it. All right, pastor, I hear you. I'm with you. So far, I, those two things are really good arguments, but I have a question. Actually, I have a, problem. I have a problem with those people who go to church because they get on my nerves because they are so hypocritical. After all, the church is just jammed full of hypocrites. You ever heard that one? I love it. I love it. Oh, get ready to hit this out of the park. Are you ready to know what to say to that? You are absolutely right. And what better place for us. The church is not a museum for perfect people. It's a hospital for the hurting. It's for those who don't claim to have it all together. Jesus said, the, the well don't need a doctor. I come for the sick. There's no pride allowed here. There's no arrogance. We, we all agree. We, ain't none of us got it together. This is not a display. This is not like a giant Window shopping thing with a glass thing where you walk up and go, hmm, wow, well, look at that guy today. He has it all together. Today we're displaying this. And no, it is a hospital for the hurting where people can come and go, you know what? I identify with them. We're not here to display. If you find a perfect church and you join it, it's not going to be perfect anymore. How about that? Because we're not perfect. Every one of us is imperfect. There's no one perfect here, and no one will ever claim to be perfect. In fact, I love this. There is a trend taking over churches that is beautiful. They're actually wearing shirts that say this exact thing. No perfect people allowed. Y'all, that is awesome. Because ain't none of us got it all together. I share painfully embarrassing stories of my failures practically every week. Ain't nobody got it all together. That's why it's awesome news that we serve a God who does. That's incredible. One of the greatest races in all of NASCAR is the Daytona 500. Even if you don't follow NASCAR, which I didn't until recently, you've heard of this. This is that place where cars zoom by at 200 miles an hour, and they come screaming by 100,000 fans, and it is awesome. And it shakes the rafters. It is amazing. You need to go at least once. They have a guy called the Grand Marshal. The Grand Marshal shows up. He's usually a celebrity, and he gets picked to say the most famous words in all of sports. Gentlemen, start your engines. And the crowd goes wild. I guess you had to be there, but the crowd goes wild. 
And it's incredible. I'm serious, you got to go. I don't even know how to like start a car, basically, but I love this. This was so amazing. I got to go to Charlotte. On this particular day, there was an actor by the name of James Franco who was selected to be the Grand Marshal. If you've heard this story, then you know how awkward this got real fast. Because James was used to saying, gentlemen, start your in. There was just one problem with that phrase on this race. That's not a gentleman. Who is that? Danica Patrick. And I don't know if he got caught up in it. I don't know if he forgot. She's not the first one who had ever raced at the high level that had been a, a lady. But she was the first one to have ever won the pole. She started in first place. She, had, she got to pick her pole position, her, her pit and her, her stall and all that stuff. If you don't know, it's a big deal, okay? That had never happened before. She was going to start from the pole. I don't know if he got flustered or what, because poor James did not mean to say what he said. Some people had whispered to him, listen, all you have to do is change one word to drivers, start your engine, or lady and gentlemen, start your engine. That's what people have done before when the ladies are racing. Well, poor Jimmy <laughs> didn't get the memo. And what he did was he was halfway through his windup, and then it dawned on him, uh-oh. So what he ended up saying was so awkward. He ended up saying, drivers. And Danica, start your engines. Oh, my goodness. You would have thought he had shot her. The internet blew up. The controversy was gone. Little Jimmy, he didn't even know it had started. All he knew was he kind of bumbled it. It was an awkward beginning. But what had happened was all of her fans took offense at that because he, he didn't separate Danica from gentlemen. He separated Danica from drivers, giving a backhanded, almost insult of, all the drivers are, oh, and bless your heart, little Danica too. You could start your car too. <laughs> and that's how her fans took it, and they went crazy, and they were so mad, oh man, because everybody's, good morning America, what offends us today, right? There's got to be something. You're a victim. So here's this thing that, that, that started awkwardly and was awful. And it may not have begun perfectly in any way, shape, or form, but the race went on, and it was awesome. And here is the lesson for us, church. Don't miss this. In the Bible, King Solomon, the wisest man to have ever lived, said this, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. If you wait for the perfect weather to plant your seeds, you will never reap that bountiful harvest. If you wait for the perfect time, that you can afford to have kids. <laughs> you will never have kids. And if you wait for the perfect moment to join the perfect church, it'll never happen. And you will never reap the benefits of belonging, of community that God instills. So when you hear someone say, the church, I don't like it. It's so imperfect. It bothers me. I see so many hypocrites nod with them. And then maybe gently suggest and lovingly suggest this truth. Maybe what bothers you should actually amaze you. Oh, this is so good. You see, the fact that Jesus started the church and moves through the church with imperfect people like me and you should actually make us marvel at God's amazing grace, that he still uses, that he hasn't given up on us, that he would come down and use ordinary broken human beings as vessels of his grace is phenomenal. Imperfect, but that's what God uses for the church. That's what we just read in Ephesians 3. The idea that God would use me and you is amazing. Yeah, the church is messy. Yeah, community is messy. Yeah, family can be messy. It happens. Amen. I heard that. Woo. That's okay. You're safe here. Family's messy. You met mine. Come on. Not you, baby. Not you. Sorry. I got so used to them being gone. Uh, they're bad. Uh. Tion, we'll edit that out, right, in the stream? Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, things are messy. Exhibit A. We live in a broken world. People are fallen. People sin. Leaders sin. Leaders make silly comments. It happens. But that's the beauty of it. This is, this is the amazing thing. When we see that God works through us to accomplish his will, that's a sign of his grace, not his absence. Here's a beautiful truth. The church gives the world a front row seat to the grace of God. What a beautiful illustration. That's what we're supposed to be. It should amaze people. 
This is an amazing statement, and people overlook it. When we gather together, we serve others, and we love each other, and we share the grace of God. It makes so much impression on the world when they see that we're the first ones down after a hurricane serving. When they see that we're the first ones to cook a meal for someone who's grieving, we walk beside them. When they see that no one is asking for the spotlight and we're serving in the nursery or teaching a group or going on mission trip to Ghana or picking up trash after everyone's left and don't ask for one thing, no spotlight, no one even knows. Man, it, it wows people and it plays with their head. What is different about you? We can say, you know, I'm glad you noticed it's not me. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you about somebody I met that changed my life. We give the world a front row seat to the grace of God. So who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to join something like that? Who would like us detached from the local church? Who do you think would like us to feel like we should go through life alone on an island? I'll tell you this. The only one who wants Christians to believe we're better off alone is our enemy. And if you think about it, it is a brilliant strategy. If I was the enemy, that is exactly what I would do. Try to pick you off and alienate you and alienate you. You're the only one going through what you're going through. Nobody else feels like you do. You should suffer in silence. That's a lie from the devil. We're all going through mess sideways. That's why we come together and we link arms. We hug and we cry and we laugh. You can't get that by yourself. Everybody is craving authentic connection now more than ever. In 2004, there was this unknown little skinny computer guy this little whiz kid who was a sophomore at Harvard, and he had an idea. And what he wanted to do was to post pictures of fellow students side by side and have others log on and vote who was better looking. You could actually vote for all to see who was more attractive. There's just one problem with that. It hurt a lot of feelings, and it made a lot of people mad. In fact, Harvard found out about it, and they called the guy in, and they said, if you don't shut this down, we will expel you. I don't care how much you've paid. We will expel you and shut it down. He did for a little bit. And then he turned over here and he began quietly writing new code and adding more features and improving the concept. But this time he decided to allow people to post other information, to leave comments, to leave pictures, and be, try to create this gathering place, a place to belong. And he quietly opened it up to Yale and Stanford and Columbia, and it began to take off. This little scrawny computer whiz kid went by the name of Mark Zuckerberg. And he renamed his thing Facebook. And it exploded. The rest is history. You know this. And it became this online community. Soon people were sharing and liking, and it would become this multi-billion dollar company so popular that it even spawned new words in the Oxford English Dictionary. Words like friended <laughs> and uh, unfriended. In fact, it was the first time in the dictionary that friend was now a verb and not a noun. Wrap your mind around that. I unfriend you. Boop. <laughs> Think about that. This thing, it went everywhere, and people were sharing and loving it, and it was incredible. People could log on and have community with people 24 hours a day and never leave your house, and it was powerful, and it still is. In fact, we use it as a church to reach thousands every week. You just don't know we're doing it. It's a beautiful thing, except as time went on, there was one thing that began to emerge. One shortfall, one thing it couldn't provide. And that revealed the apparent limits of this online community, this gathering place. As great as it is, as useful as it is, and it is, people began to notice there was still no substitute for the kind of flesh and blood connection that you can only make in a local body. They realized there was friendships that needed to go deeper than a few characters that needed to flourish, that needed to thrive, where people can actually hug each other, where you can laugh and you can celebrate and you can fist bump and you can high five and go, woo, and give pastor a sweaty hug and say, that was another mediocre sermon. And you could kind of cheer people on and love people. Or maybe you could come up and put your arm around them and say, I am so, so sorry. I know you're grieving and I know you're hurting. We've lined up. We want to bring you a meal. Can I take your kids? Can, can, can we give you a break? Is there anything we can do? Can I pray with you? Can I take your hands and pray with you? And people started to realize that this was a beautiful thing to walk hand in hand with somebody through a darkest valley that you couldn't get online. 
the local church is that place. It is his idea because he knew we would need it. And it is a beautiful thing. We're not meant to go through life alone, trudging along, struggling in silence and suffering, thinking it's just us. We're by ourselves on some island having just this limited impact for God because when we joined up, we could do amazing things. That's why it's a place to belong. And that's what we offer each other today, a place to come and belong. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for the privilege that you've given us to be the church, to unite, to be in a place where we can belong, where we can let down our guard and be real and authentic. To have community, God, that is uh, not superficial but allows us to go deeper, as deep as you want us to go, as deep as we are willing to go and let down our guard. God, I thank you for this safe place. Lord, I pray for somebody here today that may need a touch from you. I pray you would give it to them. I pray that you would lift the burdens of the heavy-hearted. And for those who are having great times and things are awesome, Lord, we rejoice with them because you told us to, to celebrate with those who celebrate and to weep with those who weep. God, help us to serve others. Help us to be on mission for you, to make disciples of all men. We thank you for this great church. We take no credit for all the good. It is all you. It is always you. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.